Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome, warm literally as well. This room has very little uh, air conditioning, so I'm going to be very brief in my introduction, so Ira has uh, the word. Um, I think most of you know uh, Professor Ira Katz-Nelson. He's been associated with the Institute for very, very long. He is vice chair of our um, academic advisory board, and now he is a member of the uh, board as well. He is a, a Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History at Columbia University. And in this academic year, he's uh, spent at uh, the University of Cambridge, where he's the Pitt Professor of American History and Institutions. Ira's work has straddled comparative politics and political theory, as well as um, uh, political and social history. Um, most of his uh, teaching has been at um, Columbia University with a spell in between at uh, Chicago and also at the Graduate Faculty of New School for Social Research where he was dean from uh, 83 to 89. Uh, I don't know, probably Ira is happy about the fact that he has given up office as president of the Social Science <laughs> Research Council, uh, but uh, under Ira's presidency, I think the Social Science Research Council has had some very, very um, uh, interesting and uh, path-breaking programs. So, um, although he's probably happy to return uh, to academia uh, full-time, I think now that you don't have the office, we can hope to see you more often at the IWM because I think that excuse is no longer given. And just let me mention two or three books for those of you who would like to have a little bit um, of an academic uh, background here. The most recent book is um, Fear Itself, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time. Uh, the one before that, Liberal uh, Beginnings, uh, Making a Republic for the Moderns. Ira's done a lot of work on affirmative action. Uh, one of the major foci of his research has been liberalism, and that is the book he is currently writing, a uh, series of essays on liberal reason. Uh, liberalism Crooked Circle as well, I think. I forgot that. These are letters to Adam Mishnick, which some of you may know from uh, the context uh, of the region here. The uh, lecture uh, tonight is on Who is the People? Reflections on Popular Sovereignty, addressing one of the major dilemmas of liberal theory, its inability really to deal with the question, what are the bounds of the political community? How do we determine criteria for membership? How uh, should one use uh, liberal principles to determine inclusion and exclusion in the political community? So Ira, you have the word. Let me get organized. It's so nice to be here. Um, uh, so many good friends and, and, uh, in the audience. Um, my only, uh, I would critique all of you. It's the most beautiful day outside. Um, it doesn't come by very often. Perhaps in Vienna every day it's warm and sunny, but uh, certainly not in the UK where I've been spending my time. So perhaps. I'll speak for five minutes, we can go party outside, but uh, probably not. Anyway, the, the, let me start with um, the, t the title, which of course um, one of my children said to me, um, actually a granddaughter said to me, it's grammatically incorrect. Who are the people? Um, but, the, uh, but in fact, that's a central issue. Um, uh, the question of the relationship of a plurality to singularity, and under what conditions does a people emerge that deserves um, the is as opposed to the are. And I'll speak about that a bit, um, especially in the American context. Um, I also, of course we all know that the American Constitution itself begins with we the people, and um, whether that's seen as a collective, singular collective, or as a plural collectivity is a, an interesting um, question. I, I just want to simply first say warm thanks for the invitation, uh, especially to Shalini, under um, whose uh, inspired leadership the 
uh, this institute is, um, goes from strength to, to strength. Um, this also is personally um, uh, a moment uh, that has a certain wistfulness attached to it, not only seeing dear colleagues from I met a quarter century uh, ago, but um, um, I can't help but think of um, the first rector, uh, Krzysztof Mahalski, who, um, who taught me so much um, about questions like this, um, who is the people. Now, the, the principle of, um, of popular sovereignty forms the practical and normative uh, foundation of liberal, constitutional, representative um, democracies. Um, at some moments, the central questions, central dilemmas of popular sovereignty remain dormant as taken for granted common sense. But at other moments, um, including the present, uh, questions that are central to the ideas of popular sovereignty uh, burst into the public uh, arena. Um, today, these matters, um, whether in Catalonia or in Britain or in the rise of various forms of populism, are um, filled with urgency in a world defined by interdependence, um, large-scale migrations, a loss of faith in democracy by many, and rapid economic, cultural, technical, technological change. Now, I'm going to speak in three parts. Part one, introduction. Um, uh, but here I want to talk about the concept itself, its origins, its inherent tensions. And then I'm going to talk about the American experience, in particular um, 17th and 18th and into 19th century America, um, which was in many respects the principal site of the formation of the most extended ideas about and practices of popular sovereignty. And then I'll conclude with a third um, section of this talk um, focused on the question of who is the people, uh, who, the membership question, issues of inclusion and exclusion, and uh, what criteria um, are, uh, exist and which are legitimate in thinking about those issues. There was a great text, to me a little text, published by the wonderful historian uh, Edmund Morgan um, in 19, it was written in 1976 for the American Bicentennial. Um, Morgan, many of you might know, was a historian at Yale um, who wrote a truly amazing book ab about American slavery, American freedom. Um, he wrote about the American Puritans. Um, he wrote many things. But on popular sovereignty, he concluded that essay by writing, the will of the people is still uncertain, imperfectly realized, and vulnerable. Perhaps the questions are unanswerable. But as we look at countries where the quest for better answers has been stifled, and stifled by parties claiming to act in the name of the people, we dare not yet give it up. Now, there are many questions that he was concerned with that we are concerned with. But just to linger for a moment on the, the countries where the quest for better answers have been stifled. Um, when he wrote in 1976, unlike the world of 1776, um, virtually no regime on earth would say we're not grounded in the legitimacy of the people, of popular sovereignty. 20th century experienced people's democracies. Um, the 20th century experienced um, fascist and Nazi regimes that claimed to be based in the unit, the united singular rule of um, uh, of an abstract authorizing uh, people, but a people with boundaries, the Italian nation, the German race, um, and in Bolshevik countries, the working class. Um, so popular sovereignty had moved from a being a, um, an unusual outlier revolutionary doctrine to being the common sense of virtually every regime um, 
on Earth. So there are countries where the quest for better answers had been stifled, but the answers about the problems of popular sovereignty which had become universal. But in any event, what does it mean for the people to be sovereign? What indeed um, is the will of the people? How is it to be ascertained? How is it to be evaluated? Um, and is that will a fixed will, as it was certainly in the imagery of um, the leading 20th century dictatorships that claimed to be democracies, um, or is it ever changing? Now, Tocqueville. Um, this is, is Tocqueville, a chapter four of um, uh, Democracy in America, where he wrote, this is uh, published in 1835, um, uh, based on field work in 1830 and 1831. Tocqueville uh, announced that the people um, uh, rule in America as God rules in the universe. And I have to confess that that's the origin of this talk, um, reading that chapter and thinking, what impelled Tocqueville um, to find that the people rule in America as God reigns over the universe? What is the meaning of that? Well, let's think about it for a moment and think about the people in terms of a, might be called a ladder of abstraction. Um, the people, and by the way, I'm speaking in declarative sentences, kindly put a question mark after every one of these sentences because I'm just really beginning to think about these questions. And I wanted to test these ideas here in, in this particular place. Um, the people are a population, a multitude of uh, natural, proper named persons. Um, with identities, mores, uh, preferences. The sphere of private people together come together as a public, in the language of uh, Jürgen Habermas. But there's a subset of the population who are citizens. It could be a small or large um, uh, 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 subset. These are the people as persons eligible to participate actively and equally in the institutions of representative democracy. Need not at all be identical to the population or the multitude. And third, there's a more abstract, if we climb up a ladder of abstraction, there's um, the people as an abstract uh, uh, people. The product of what I call here a secular form of enchantment, the ultimate indivisible source of political legitimacy. Um, and all these arrows you see are not very artistically, but uh, meant to indicate important questions lie in the relations among these three levels. What's the connection between the people as a multitude and citizenry? Citizenry, actual citizens, and the abstract notion of a community of citizens, each of the three. Um, uh, together. What are the, how do we think about the ties between them and among them? Um, and we could ask these questions every time we see the people, um, multitude, citizens, or is it the abstract people assembling? On the left, um, you see the White House um, in March 1929, which is the inauguration of President Andrew Jackson. Um, a president, um, a capital D Democrat of Democratic Party, a lowercase d Democrat as well, at least for a subset of the population. Um, and um, this is the Jackson inauguration, um, which uh, I'll say a bit more about in a moment. But on the right is um, a picture that I was stunned when I looked at it because it's almost identical in um, shape, form, and structure to the 1829. This is um, 1984, and it's the funeral of uh, Father Popoyushko, who was killed um, by the police, secret police, in, in, um, uh, kidnapped and killed in Poland. And this is at his church. And even if you blow up these pictures, you see 
a striking similarity, a symbol of authority, a, a gathering, um, a multitude gathering, but coming together in each of the three levels that of which I spoke. These are, it's a multitude. Um, the state in Poland said a mob, um, but a multitude. Um, it is um, a gathering either of actual or proto or possible citizens. Um, and it's a gathering that claimed the legitimacy of an abstract people making uh, a presence and making demands. So the multitude, the citizens, and the people as authority. And of course, we have a, a, a series of orienting questions. I, it says, Bard College Berlin and Hurdy School class on popular sovereignty. The Social Science Research Council, which you kindly mentioned in, a, in, in, a, in New York, has now sponsored a series of courses globally. Um, there's one taking place now at Tufts College, uh, Tufts University, um, one in, in Berlin, uh, one uh, in um, Swarthmore, um, one at the University of North Carolina, uh, and so on. Um, uh, and this is from the syllabus of the Berlin class. Current debates on Brexit in Catalonia, the resurgent anti-immigrant nationalism in the West, persisting challenges about who governs with respect to diverse types of policy, raise difficult questions about who constitutes the people, about when and how they should participate in collective decision making. And we already mentioned many of these questions, but we should ask which conditions made this type of authority possible? What is the scope and dimensions of popular sovereignty, so authority? When and in what matter should the people make collective decisions? Who in theory and in fact are the people on what bases, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the way they introduce their syllabus. I want, um, I'll, I'll come back to Tocqueville. I thought the slide was next. It's not. Don't worry about it. I won't worry about it. But look at the, let's think a bit about the conditions um, that gave birth to the idea of popular sovereignty in early modern Europe and North America, kind of beginnings. This was a moment in which a series of large-scale um, social and political processes um, transformed um, conditions of rule and brought into question the dominant feature of rule, namely legitimacy by divine right, um, or exclusively by divine right. This was a moment, early modern Europe and early North American colonies late 16th, 16th, 17th, into 18th centuries, um, a period of extraordinary state formation that, um, in which sovereignty, forget popular for a moment, sovereignty emerges in a new way as a form of concentrated capacity. Um, Yvonne and I were talking about Schmidt before. Uh, it's a, a concentration of the capacity to make and take decisions, um, and which in early modern Europe was a, a kind of collection of sovereignty, sovereign capacity into centers from the segmented or what uh, Perry Anderson has called parcelized sovereignty that characterized the medieval world. And any one of these new states had always had at least three qualities. A claim of indivisible control over people and land, that's what we typically mean by sovereignty. A distinctive ensemble of institutions, not reducible to the economy or to civil society. And a legitimating story, um, uh, replacing cross-border theological claims, it says slames there, but it meant to say claims, of popes and emperors. So if you look at um, the cross-border world of the Catholic Church or the cross-border world of the Holy Roman Empire, um, the legitimation was exclusively theological, but no longer for these states. They had larger, they faced and ruled larger and more complex social structures and communities. They had to deal post-Reformation with religious pluralism. There was a massive advance in uh, transportation technology and therefore more contested boundaries of territory and persons. There were new kinds of collisions of cultures and civilizations. 
There was what Sven Beckert in his great book on cotton calls war capitalism of empires and global markets, a global warfare about who will control the new globe, and slavery, race, capture, surveillance, of, and slave trade. All of these processes were in play simultaneously, and it's in this embrace that the radical idea of popular sovereignty first emerged. And it was an idea that, now, should footnote, of course there were some versions of popular sovereignty in ancient Greece and in Rome, and there were notions of sovereignty, but what happens in this period is that ideas about sovereignty and popular sovereignty moved beyond the confines of city-states to which it had been bound both amongst the ancients and in small medieval republics. Now popular sovereignty is fused as with states and state formation um, under global conditions that have been dramatically altered. And there were a series of inherent challenges that quickly emerged for popular sovereignty in a world of sovereign states and increasingly complex and plural civil societies. And I've listed some, they're pretty obvious. Um, there was the issue of divine right fighting against um, uh, ideas of the people um, possessing constituent power. And we see in this, the first, I think the first great text, but there are political theorists in this room who will know better than I, was Hobbes before Leviathan in De Kive, um, in which he announces the people have pos possess the capacity to create a regime. And the regime could be, he says, an aristocracy, it could be a democracy, or his preferred outcome, a monarchy. But it's the, the people who create these regimes, not God. Um, then there's the issue of, but for Hobbes, once the people exercise constituent power, their power stops in his preferred world. Uh, they have no power over the monarch. The monarch has all power to keep security and order, etc. Um, but then Locke tells us, has another tension, the people who possess constituent power now have their powers extended to patterns of active representation. And in the second treatise, uh, Locke tells us that the central institution of a good polity is the legislature is the site of political representation in which the people um, find the state to be permeable to their preferences, their interests, their values, and so on. But then you have a third issue, which the American Revolution was based on, between popular parliamentary sovereignty and the idea of popular sovereignty beyond popular sovereignty uh, into the notion of an active, if you like, agonistic, uh, citizenry, um, because um, well, you will know that the American Revolution was a war against parliamentary sovereignty, um, not a war simply for parliamentary sovereignty. And then you have the other sets of inherent issues which you could see immediately forming in the 17th and 18th centuries, questions of membership, degrees and standards of inclusion, the potential problem of demagogic leaders, the potential problem of the people as a mob, and then the question of how open or how closed membership would be even within any given polity. And to think about these questions, I'd like to think about American origins, which um, the American Revolution is referred to in the most recent book by the historian of ideas, Jonathan Israel, as an expanding blaze. That is, he argues that, you know, he's written multiple volumes, controversial volumes, personally not in full agreement with, their, with these volumes about the history of the Enlightenment, in which he distinguishes a, what he calls a moderate from a radical Enlightenment. He identifies the United States, American origins as part of the radical Enlightenment with roots in Spinoza. Um, but in any event, he appropriately, it seems to me, says, the American Revolution ignited an expanding blaze. Um, predates the French Revolution, and it remained throughout the 19th and 20th centuries and beyond, perhaps, 
um, a beacon of the meaning of uh, popular sovereignty. And let's return for a moment to Tocqueville. Because in the uh, volume one, chapter four, um, Tocqueville writes the following. He's distinguishing three types of popular sovereignty. There are countries, or, or sovereignty, not popular sovereignty. There are countries in which a power, in some sense external to the social body, acts on it and forces it to march in a certain direction. Divine right is what is being referred to here. There are other countries in which force is divided, being placed at once inside society and outside it. This is his reference, I believe, to parliamentary sovereignty in Britain, where you have a world of the king in parliament. There is a monarchy, but there, who, in his language, stands outside society as a site of neutrality. Um, and then you have um, uh, the inside of um, uh, society through parliament. But nothing of the kind, he said, exists in the United States. Their society acts by itself and on itself. No power exists but within its bosom. It is fair to say that the people govern themselves. The people reign over the American political world as God rules over the universe. They are the cause and end of all things. Everything proceeds from them. To them, everything returns. And it's from that perspective that James Madison, in selling the Constitution, to the Virginia Convention um, after the 1787 Constitution was written. He said about the Constitution referring to popular sovereignty, it is in a manner unprecedented. We cannot find one express example in the experience of the world, a claim of then American exceptionalism. Now, um, just to return for a second to a point I made 15, 20 minutes ago, um, popular sovereignty is no longer unprecedented. What is, would be unprecedented is a rejection of popular sovereignty. So in some ways, modern political history is the history of um, the unfolding um, and uh, extension of this notion of the people rule, um, which is, um, uh, a story which I don't think has been properly um, told. How could it come to be that this basis of legitimacy becomes the fundamental basis on which both democracies and authoritarian countries and dictatorships and totalitarianism have all come to stand? Um, so from the outlier to the universal. In any event, um, it is popular sovereignty is a statement about supreme power. It is the location of command. John Adams, in his diary, wrote in America, the greatest question ever yet agitated in all civil states. It is necessary there should be some where be lodged a supreme power over the whole. And then Gordon Wood, um, great historian of the American Revolution, uh, explains how um, popular sovereignty itself became um, uh, the central location of um, command. Rather than linger on him, let's turn to a text of um, America at its 50th jubilee. Um, uh, George Bancroft. Um, George Bancroft was a, uh, a great historian, the historian of 19th, in the 19th century in America. He was a child when he made this oration. 25 years old. Tocqueville was 26 when he did his field work in America. Um, it puts all of us to shame. Um, but in any event, the 25-year-old um, Bancroft was teaching um, secondary school, a kind of a high school that he had helped found in Massachusetts, and gave this speech. Let's not read it all, but we, we note that he says, um, in very Tocquevillean um, language, this is uh, almost a decade before Tocqueville published Democracy in America. The popular voice is all powerful with us. This is our oracle. This we acknowledge is the voice of God. Um, and he moves along to tell us that it was the will of the people that created our Constitution 
and not prescriptive right, not the condescension of an individual, not the terrors of religion, not the bayonets of a standing army, not the duplicity of diplomatic chicanery, not the lure of mitres, coronets, artificial distinctions. The wisdom of our people is our only, our sufficient constitutional frank package. And he called the revolution, American revolution and its system, essentially radical, which I think is better than the language that Jonathan Israel has used in which he says it's completely radical. Um, we'll come to the essentially versus not essentially in a moment. But if we look for the genuine beginning, the first expression of um, a popular formation of a regime, I think it, we find it before Hobbes and Locke wrote a word. We find it in the Mayflower Compact in Massachusetts in 1620. Uh, Solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, we, we, the people, the people were 41 people signing a document. And a people who were not pluralistic at all. They were all radical Puritans who fled um, England. But we, the people, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience." Um, it's a very, uh, we don't have time, but we could spend two hours on this um, document, uh, the place of God in, in this story. Um, but this is a civil um, uh, act. Um, these were not theologians. Um, this was a popular act. And they created a civil body politic based on their will for ordering through legislation and constitutionalism, um, which would be for the collective good and to which they pledged obligation and loyalty. And I will come back to the words obligation and loyalty later. But there's an empirical puzzle here of how we got from the Mayflower Compact, 41 people, all men. There were 109, I think, on the boat. Um, there were about nine men who didn't sign. I, I'm trying to find out who they were um, and why they weren't either eligible or wouldn't go along. And there were women and children um, who were outside the, the game at that point. Um, but how do we get from there to the moment where the United States of America was formed in 1787 under the phrase, we the people. And the people is no longer a tiny group all alike. So um, it, to be noted that the Declaration of Independence, 1776, was issued by 13 United States of America, but the United was lowercase. There were 13 states that united to um, uh, rebel, and they announced themselves free and independent, blah, et cetera, et cetera. But they had an extraordinarily diverse population. Um, as I say here, habits, faiths, backgrounds, slave, free, north, state, south, native, settler, plus unprecedented ethnic and religious diversity. And I, you'll see that I just made an accounting, really with the help of um, two texts, uh, a, a great book um, uh, tragically published as he was dying, Richard Hofstadter, wonderful historian, called America at 1750, and Bernard Balin, the Harvard historian, also a wonderful historian, who wrote four volumes on a demography and population in the colonial American period. In New York, Hudson Valley alone, you had English, Scot, Irish, Welsh, Swiss, Dutch, French, Catholic, mostly Huguenot, Walloon, Palatine, Anglicans, Catholics, Sabbatarians, anti-Sabbatarians, singing Quakers, ranting Quakers, Anabaptists, Mennonites, Amish, and Jews. 15% of the population were black slaves. There were diverse native Indians, Lenape, Mohican, Iroquois, Wappinger. We the people. Well, some of these were not part of we the people. Obviously slaves and the Native Americans. But the English, the Scot, the Irish, the Welsh, the Swiss, the Dutch, the French, etc., were. And how could that astonishing pluralism um, become 
a civic and patriotic American people. Well, I don't have the answer here. These are just some themes worth exploring. They had shared grievances as second-class Britons. They, they had Hobbesian um, uh, needs, as it were, to deal with insecurity and fear together, especially against Indians. Um, they together claimed to possess constituent power. They had practices from the Mayflower Compact on of active representation. They had to practice religious toleration because there was no other practical um, answer. And they um, had the ideas from Montesquieu, especially, of mixed government. And they created a set of institutions, Madisonian democracy, sectional compromise between North and South, um, uh, novel degrees of self-government, and separation of church and state, critically, and then um, rules about naturalization which um, limited the population uh, who could be naturalized to white people. That was in the act of 1790. But still, that was a pretty inclusive group. It would be like saying all Europeans are alike, but they're not all alike um, uh, uh, today. Um, and a little footnote story I put in parenthesis, Plantation Act of 1740. I believe this to be a hidden story of the origins of American peoplehood. Um, in 1753, the British Parliament passed the most liberal immigration act ever to that date. Uh, it was called the Jew Bill, and it allowed for the naturalization of a non-Christian group, Jews. Five months after it's passed, it's repealed, after a massive civil society uh, campaign against including this group in the people. Um, and after it's repealed, members get up in the House of Commons and say, in America, under the Plantation Act of 1740, um, any white person can come, Quakers, Jews, uh, you name it, um, uh, Muslims. Um, and if they live there for seven years, they can become American. And therefore, they can become English, uh, because that's who you become. And that's a back door um, to the mother country. We must repeal it. And the answer by the government is, we cannot repeal it, because we have a slave system in America. And we need as many white people as we can get. So we ingest pluralism in the name of slavery. Um, and we're going to have religious toleration um, in order to protect that system. And of course, that was hardwired, that kind of protection, in the American Constitution, the three-fifths. This is Madison explaining the three-fifths rule in being compelled to labor not for, I love, I mean, I love this, love in quotes, this passage. In the three-fifths rule meant the Constitution said that um, a, a slave counted as three-fifths of a person for purposes of political representation um, in the democracy. In being compelled to labor not for himself but for a master and being vendible by one master to another, in being subject at all times to be restrained in his liberty and chastised in his body, by the capricious will of another, the slave may appear to be degraded from the human rank and classed with those irrational animals which fall under the legal denomination of property. In being protected, on the other hand, in his life and his limbs against the violence of all others, even the master of his labor and his liberty, in being punishable himself for all violence committed against others, the slave is no less evidently regarded by the law as a member of the society not as a part of the irrational creation, as a moral person, not as a mere article of property. The federal constitution, therefore, decides with great propriety on the case of our slaves when it views them in the mixed character of persons and property. That, in fact, is their true character. Um, that's both uh, brilliant and chilling at the same uh, time. Now, this system created a system of membership for some, but not others, um, a system in which the people rule as God rules uh, the universe, um, faced uh, a series of critical vulnerabilities, which, although they happened a long ago, have some resemblance to vulnerabilities popular sovereignty faces today. First, um, first vulnerability came with the growth of mass political parties. Um, the American founding did not have parties, at least formally. There's no mention in the Constitution of political uh, 
parties. Parties formed first as an elite matter in the 1790s, but by the 1820s and 30s, we had mass parties with professional uh, partisanship uh, and leadership. Uh, and these parties were very good at um, solving um, puzzles that we could call divisible, where you could compromise more taxes, less taxes, etc. cetera. Um, but they proved bad instruments. I'm sorry for the print size. I violated a rule I tell all my students, never put too many words on a slide. Um, the, these parties proved very bad very soon at grappling with fundamental ethical and constitutional issues. Um, issues that, uh, of the kind that Avishai Margalit calls rotten choices, um, and that Mark Graber, the legal historian, calls problems of constitutional evil, which is um, uh, the three-fifths rule is an example of constitutional um, uh, evil. Um, mass parties are not good at these issues, even if they're very good at divisible issues. The second issue, which came up in America, came up under the heading of the frontier and issues of popular sovereignty. The American polity, which was consisted of a kind of mixed sovereignty of state sovereignty and federal <coughs> national sovereignty, moved steadily westward. Um, brilliant work being done now by a young person with the extraordinary name of Robert E. Lee. Um, as some of you will know that name as the a great Confederate general. This is a young man who's uh, coming to teach at Cambridge next year. He's a fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. He's, he's done micro-level work about the frontier. He has tracked something like five and a half to six million land transfer um, uh, contracts and uh, arrangements. So he has the micro-dynamics of the macro change of the American um, frontier. But as this frontier moved westward, along came the new president, Andrew Jackson. And he was committed to an idea of popular sovereignty that was radical at its extreme. Namely, that an eligible citizen, white citizen, should have unrestrained free movement. The state cannot have authority over where that person moves and lives. Free mobility. And slavery can therefore be extended everywhere um, because if white people wish to own slaves, their business. And Indian removal um, with that kind of settlement would be sanctioned by the national government. And in his um, presidency, we saw all these tribes uh, that I list in small print um, moved to the west of the Mississippi. His vice president was John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun was the leading intellectual of slavery in America. He had also been secret a brilliant secretary of war um, uh, previous to that. He had been the vice president in the previous administration of, of, of John Quincy Adams. Um, and then was again the vice president of Andrew Jackson. And what that signified was the notion of peoplehood in America relied absolutely on comity and agreement between the slave South and the non-slave uh, North. That it was understood by both kinds of political parties that they needed that agreement. In any event, Calhoun advanced new notions of popular sovereignty based on what he called concurrent majorities and the rights of nullification. That is, he said, the South has the right to say no. Uh, and he even proposed a dual presidency of the United States. We should have two presidents, a Southern and a Northern, and nothing could happen unless they ultimately agreed. I live in a university ruled in arts and sciences by a troika of this kind. I can tell you, not enough happens when you have to do this. In any event, what you see in extreme form here is a series of issues that actually continue to recur. Um, what are the limits um, and boundaries of, um, of sovereignty? And um, what are the rules of inclusion and exclusion? And all this came to a head in the American experience in the 1850s, when Kansas and Nebraska 
become territories wishing to be states. And this is the moment where Abraham Lincoln emerges as a national figure in debates with Senator Douglas of Illinois. Douglas said, whether these states will have slaves is a matter of popular sovereignty. Abraham Lincoln said, I believe in popular sovereignty, but it has ethical and moral limits. And some issues are outside the decision power of the people. And Ultimately, that debate got resolved not through a political process, but through a war that killed between 600 and 850,000 people, injured more than a million in a population of 31 million. So, okay, that's America. Now let's, I have talked much too long. Um, I'm gonna zip through this, but questions of loyalty and obligation. So, um, I do note, I, I rarely quote Derrida uh, favorably, but I'm going to. Um, uh, Derrida makes a very important point, I think, here. That the subject of a democratic constitution, we the people, um, is a, a kind of performative utterance that creates the people. Um, that is, the, the, the people, a single abstract people, does not exist until it's announced as existing. So this is a moment where um, uh, performance um, uh, is an act of um, creation. And the question I was asking before, which I don't yet have a good enough answer to, is how did an American people, even with its limits, um, and perhaps because of its limits, um, uh, uh, get created? But we also know that there are many different potential foundations of belonging. Long list here. Who is the people, common citizens, community, culture, blah, 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 nation, patriotism, place, solidarity, race, uh, kinship, uh, and so on. And Judith Sklar, the wonderful political theorist, the late political theorist, said one thing ties all these notions together. They all invite conflict. Trouble is their middle name. Um, and there is what we might call a permanent crisis, Istvan Hunt's language, of a divided mankind. We saw this in the American case. Um, we saw this at the very founding in the Mayflower Compact. It was, it was there because of a divided mankind. This is the central puzzle of uh, the character, the location, the meaning of popular sovereignty. And perhaps we need to have, as some have had, many have had, I quote Rawls and Taylor, um, uh, a normative and instrumental goal of combining civic obligation with particular, often intense and diverse identities to produce an inclusive, collective, shared, patriotic loyalty based on toleration and respect. And that's the question and goal set by many contemporary uh, philosophers and uh, civic actors, including um, uh, Rawls and um, Chuck Taylor, Chuck Taylor of this institute. Um, and I want to end by just making two or three um, observations. Um, first, just to, to, to say that to answer that question, I think we need um, to think about three kinds of proclivities or sensibilities. Again, too small. Um, let me tell you. The first we call pragmatic and instrumental. Um, we will not come close to a goal of that kind of um, normative and practical goal of creating a collective, shared, inclusive loyalty based on toleration and respect out of human pluralism unless we develop a kind of institutional imagination. Um, we, every time there's an institution, there's a bundle of incentives and disincentives that make more or less likely decent pluralist outcomes. But second, we also need a kind of um, Rawlsian, uh, what he called uh, um, uh, a realistic utopianism. We have to imagine something more just than we have, not so distant from what we have, and ask ourselves how we would stretch to achieve it. But on the other side, we must know, as Judith Sklar famously knew in her liberalism of fear, that things can always get worse. 
um, that cruelty um, uh, 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 threatens. And therefore, um, uh, facing up to the evil of cruelty, preventing cruelty, is at least or more important than questing for, um, uh, for future um, uh, realistic utopianism. Um, the, but then, what are the rules for membership? What are the criteria we might use? And here we have some in, in Rawls's political liberalism and some in Schlar's uh, essay on obligation, loyalty, and exile. Um, Rawls has asked, what are the grounds for toleration? How do we create? And what is so striking about political liberalism, the late work of Rawls, as opposed to his theory of justice, is precisely how he no longer plays the, the game of the veil of ignorance. Um, he rather says, let's start with the world as it is, with deep and often incommensurable differences amongst people based on moral codes, religions, um, spiritual commitments, and the like. How, he asks, is it possible to create an overlapping consensus um, in the civic sphere that grows out of the heterogeneity of human difference? How can we define pluralism so that it is reasonable pluralism? And I believe by that he means a pluralism willing to enter into the public arena an arena of giving reasons. Uh, my colleague at Columbia, Partha Chatterjee, wrote in the 1990s how deep pluralism exists when people don't have to give each other reasons. I don't have to tell you why I worship God my way. You don't have to tell me why you worship God your way. But when we enter the public arena, then we're obliged to give reasons. If we want to say abortion should be banned or not, we can't just say God commands. We have to give reasons reasons appropriate to the civic sphere. That's reasonable pluralism, the giving and not giving reasons. And then Schlar um, distinguishes two terms, which I think are fundamental, obligation and loyalty. By obligation, she writes, I mean rule-governed conduct and political obligation, specifically refers to laws and law-like demands made by public agencies. Loyalty is emotional, effective, not primarily rational. The emotional character of loyalty sets it apart from obligation. And I would say the, the really hard question is how do we, I'm going to skip for time and come back to it, church-state issues, and end with this last, um, I think it's my last slide. Um, well, we're getting close. Uh, but I'll stop with this because I've gone on. Um, the, If the question, if the goal is to combine civic obligation with intense identities to produce inclusive, then we have to quest towards standards about limits of cruel insecurity and oppression. Um, we need liberal constraints, rule of law, individual rights, effective representation, but especially we need to think about a zone between toleration and respect. The concept of toleration um, is much criticized from the right and the left, um, religious and other forms of toleration. The right, um, I'm calling the right, um, a great figure like Leszek Kolakowski wrote against toleration, saying, if I see untruth and evil, why should I tolerate it? Um, the left, Wendy Brown, says, um, toleration, um, it's just a, a cover for the fist of power. It's, uh, it's never real. It's never full respect of the other. But we can't do without toleration. A world without toleration is a world of persecution, cruelty, and violence. The question is, then, how we find the zone between toleration and respect, one that allows for the physical presence and security of those not exactly like us, which offers that often disliked minority, mainstream material conditions, which gives regard for their self-determining cultures and offers civic um, membership. This is um, a continuum, modernity's continuum. 
And I'm going to end with two quotations, um, one from Judas Sklar and one from His Holiness John Paul II. Um, Sklar, um, writing about exclusion. The dwellers in refugee camps can best be compared to America's African slaves. Exiles are often created by governments that betray their own citizens. Governments also frequently abuse residents under their jurisdiction by denying them membership in the polity and other right, not as a matter of legal punishment, but because they belong to a group thought to be inherently unfit for inclusion. And then we have a, the alternative vision, a vision announced by um, John Paul. Um, uh, which goes like this in his uh, autobiography. Um, in the course of its millennial history, Poland has been a state made up of many nationalities, many religions, mostly Christian, but not only Christian. This tradition has been and still is the source of a positive aspect of Polish culture, namely its tolerance and openness toward people who think differently, who speak other languages, or who believe, pray, or celebrate the same mysteries of faith in a different way. And I would simply conclude from his late mouth, from his mouth to God's ears. Thank you very much. Sure. Happy. So I'm just going to open immediately uh, for a discussion about half an hour, Steve. Hi, Ari. Thank you. That was great. Uh, just two little questions. How do you think about popular sovereignty in the founding and the Electoral College? One. And second, and this, I think you implicitly were getting toward an answer at the end. How, do you ha how can you help us think about the relation between the whiteness of the popular sovereign at the founding and the today's just um, uh, odious revival of white supremacy and white nationalism in the United States? Thank you very much. Also a question. Could you have the idea of the people and popular sovereignty without the dream of a state? Without? A dream of a state. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, let's, we could spend the next hour and a half on these two questions. Um, should, I, should I wait for more questions, no, Shalini? Why or, don't you start with the two? Yeah. This OK. Small ones. Uh, small ones. Um, uh, and um, in future, uh, colleagues who ask questions, kindly identify yourselves. That was Stephen Holmes. That was Ivan Krastev. Uh, not was, still is. I mean, right there. <laughs> right there so far. Um, electoral college. Uh, let me put the issue of electoral college in a slightly larger frame, though it encompasses it. Because I think it was part of the institutional imagination that made it possible to create a we the people. Um, uh, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily to do with two issues. They were related to each other. One was how you move from a situation in which there are the lowercase United States of America to the capital United States of America. Um, and that required uh, decisions about a kind of mixed sovereignty. Um, not entirely unfamiliar in contemporary debates uh, where we're where we are this evening about Europe. Um, they're not, not identical, but um, there's a, a question of how you move from 13, there was a question of how you move from 13 states to uh, a single united state. Um, and the, this was one, not the only instrument, the, the fact that we had a Senate in which um, states, every state gets two seats irrespective of population. Um, uh, but the Electoral College is another, which made it possible for those who most wish to preserve um, state sovereignty, in the older sense, to join the United States of America. But there was a second and overlapping issue, which was profound, which was the slave question. Um, and this was a means um, to ensure that no president of the United States could be elected um, absent support from all the regions of the country. That is, if the slave South supported someone else, the person they didn't support could not become president of the United States. What was completely unanticipated, and it bears on the whiteness issue in a way, was that um, 
by the 1850s, it, because of demographic change, including mass migration of uh, Irish and Germans to the north primarily, and a kind of a proto-industrialization going on and urbanization in the north, the mix of population changed so that the count of electoral college votes now made it possible to elect a president of the United States without one electoral vote from the South. And that person's name was Abraham Lincoln. And it was that development that triggered secession and civil war. Um, I mean, it's not the whole explanation of civil war, but it was the, it was the practical um, uh, implementation under specific demographic conditions that um, uh, made the South fear that if they stayed in the Union, that new majority um, would recurringly elect and select leaders um, who would be enemies of slavery. And as early as 1853, 4, um, Lincoln was calling slavery a moral abomination. Um, the, now, the whiteness question um, is striking in, the, in many ways, and it, again, could um, last for, for, for days. Um, one of the things that always strikes me, and it strikes my students when I have them read Frederick Douglass, for example, the great um, slave and then great abolitionist, is that the demands he placed on the polity were never um, anti-liberal or anti-democratic or li anti-liberal democratic. They were simply demands for inclusion in the world in which the people rule as God rules the universe. We wish to join the people. Um, the greatest struggle in American history, I mean, I'm saying something everyone in this room knows, um, has been that boundary, that plus the Native American boundary, which in some ways is less resolved in some ways than the African American um, uh, boundary. Um, uh, but be that as it may, the, because that's been the most contested boundary in our experience from the start, um, even from the moment um, Mayflower was 1620, um, uh, is when the, the ship lands. Um, 1619 is when the first slave ship. Um, we're, we're on the eve of the 400th anniversary of, emblematically, of the slave ship and the free ship. Um, uh, the people with constituent power and people with no power at all um, arriving simultaneously uh, in North America, and um, the fact that America is born more free and more slave than any single country on earth remains the, the condition which we're still struggling with. But, um, and in some ways, I, I think it's emblematic of a wider puzzle, if I, I'm sorry to go on so long. If you think about the impact of um, enlightenment uh, thought and capacities of which this American story is a part, as it were, um, or the growth of political liberalism as a part of, um, as Jonathan Israel would locate it, as part of the Enlightenment. Under Enlightenment conditions, um, the continuum from, um, of uh, inclusion, justice, uh, freedom on the one side, and ultimate exclusion of, um, on the other has widened. So the, um, uh, you know, it, it, genocide to complete pluralism, as it were, which makes our world um, both more appealing and more dangerous. Um, so when whiteness reappears, or the forms of whiteness reappear, a form of whiteness appeared in, a, a peculiar form of whiteness appeared in Germany um, uh, in the 20th century, and we know what happened. Um, it is the most dangerous um, uh, uh, feature, but without it being self-consciously identified, it also can't be overcome. Um, and that's why um, we have such things as affirmative action and so on, however contested they are, uh, as ways of trying to create a world in which the boundary of civic inclusion, material inclusion, cultural inclusion, and spatial inclusion uh, becomes possible. Um, in, uh, and we, we will struggle with that, not just in America, but uh, more broadly for a long time to come, divided world. 
Um, uh, Yvonne's question asks a question which I'm not sure I know the answer to, but I'll, I'll give one anyway. Um, I think the answer is no. Um, that is, the question was, is it possible to imagine modern, under modern, the modern world, popular sovereignty absence a state frame? Uh, that I understood. And I think the answer is no. And I would say more broadly that the very tradition uh, of um, liberalism itself, political liberalism, was inherently from the start, and it, it's within its embrace that modern mass democracy emerges to this funny combination of liberal democracy. <coughs> liberalism itself was statist from the start. Um, liberalism is a formula for dealing with a world of um, structural differentiation between these new jumbo modern states, separate economy, property and sovereignty are not reducible to one and the other, except for the Bolshevik experiment, which failed, and civil society is distinct from the state. There's a s distinctive ensemble of institutions, sovereign claims, and normative stories that go with stateness. Um, and what liberalism is, is a, is a conceptual and practical theory for dealing with the character of rules and transactions between state and society, state and economy, and state and other states. But it always bumps up against three questions about which that tradition has not much to say, uh, except a quest for rationality. Membership, who gets to be a member of the liberal regime, um, questions of security and national security. Um, we see this in Locke wrestling with prerogative power. We see it in the Federalist Papers with Hamilton writing that there are situations where um, we have to go outside the Constitution to protect the polity, um, and issues of wealth, property, and inequality. Um, how great can it be and still have a civic, common civic culture? But I don't I mean, you can have small self-governing groups um, that are not states, but I think the idea of popular sovereignty is deeply embedded in the history of modern state formation. I'll try to be shorter. I answer. Yeah. Um, Identify yourself, please. Robert Skidelsky. Ah. Um, I, you talked about the tension between loyalty and obligation. I wonder what your view is on this. Do you think one can have a sense of obligation without a sense of loyalty? In other words, whether a loyalty is a necessary condition for um, accepting um, an obligation. I mean, it, it seems to me that one of the reasons international law is so weak um, is precisely because of the absence of that. And I know, um, of course, conservative political philosophers in particular claim that um, he, there has to be a pre-political sense before politics are possible. Um, that is a pre-political sense of identity, if you like. Before politics are possible. Politics don't create it. They, um, they um, are made possible by it. So it's a, it's a fundamental question you're asking. Um, uh, the reason I spent the middle section of my talk on the American experience and the birth of a people out of the heterogeneity, even the white heterogeneity of the colonial um, uh, British North American period is precisely because it raises questions about the ne necessity to have prefigured uh, deep identities as a condition of creating a common and successful civic people. Um, not that the American story is a perfect story by any means. I, it fell apart in the middle of the 19th century. It's, been bruised and contused by all kinds of uh, uh, deep uh, problems and even evil. Um, but at the same time, it is a, um, a story of um, unmatched um, uh, liberal democratic con continuity with the same constitution. Um, we can read it differently, but it's, it's still the same document um, as at the founding. Um, so. Uh, it, if you were to put the question, is um, a sense of legitimate obligation more likely when there's prior loyalty as there was in the Mayflower Compact in some intense way? The answer is almost certainly yes. But for us, I think 
the more important question in a way is since I don't believe that it is possible to attain in today's pluralisms, um, I don't care whether we're talking about Europe or North America or um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa um, uh, or India um, uh, and so on. It's almost impossible to find a, a, a setting with homogeneous prefigured loyalties being the basis of a single common civic obligation. So we're thrown up against the question of how to create this bonding of um, obligation and loyalty <coughs> under conditions of deep pluralism. Um, I have a more practical question. And please identify yourself. Um, I, uh, I want to know your opinion about uh, the new dual legislative system, meaning uh, laws made in parliament by agent, by the, by the selective agent, or directly by the people, by Referendum. every single man and woman uh, um, participating. Is this the future, or is this only a concept not uh, to be realized? I mean, we, uh, this is the issue of uh, appealing to the people's voice directly through referenda as opposed to the lawmaking process of parliaments. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, the, uh, let me enter that question by the side door. Um, some of you may know that the, the historian of ideas, political theorist uh, Richard Tuck, has written and published a book called The Sleeping Sovereign. Um, which is about, among other things, sovereignty and popular sovereignty. A very important book, I think. And he points out in a chapter on America um, that by the 1840s, um, every American state was conducting referenda, um, especially referenda connected to constituent power, um, that is the power to revive, recreate state constitutions. So in the Jacksonian era, when America becomes in some sense more democratic, when uh, property qualifications for voting are almost entirely eliminated, um, there are not too many of them, but they had existed. In a period when um, there was an elimination of established churches, Massachusetts had um, uh, the Anglican Church, um, Episcopalian Church was um, it was actually a Congregationalist Church, I think, was the established church of Massachusetts until the 1840s. The national government permitted no establishment of religion, but states could. Well, all this gets pushed aside in constitutional change in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, and always by referenda, the constituent power of the people. And here, and the American Constitution, of course, was adopted by vote of the people in each of their states who elected delegates who would either be for or against the Constitution, pro-federalist or anti-federalist. I think that the distinction between constituent power and ordinary lawmaking um, is a reasonable one. Um, and that, so unlike California or Switzerland that has referenda about almost anything, um, and unlike countries that never have referenda, um, I think it's perfectly reasonable um, when um, constituent power issues are at stake to um, to go to the people. However, I would say that only if multiple conditions um, surround those referenda, and um, uh, we could talk at length later if you like about that, but the one ex the recent example of the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom would not have met my criteria for um, a decent referendum. Um, it was more like a, um, a simple-minded public opinion poll uh, without um, uh, projecting the actual content of choice and, uh, with an educational document. So if you were to compare, uh, this is a ridiculous thing I'm about to say, the, the rhetoric of debate at Brexit, which is some of which I experienced firsthand, um, and the rhetoric of debate represented, say, by the writings of uh, John Jay and Madison and Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalists, who were quite brilliant as well, in the public realm, or the debate between Lincoln and Douglas about popular sovereignty, um, you would find uh, no comparison uh, whatsoever. 
this might be a story about the general debasement of political rhetoric, but the point is, it is possible, it seems to me, for a limited number of fundamental questions um, to go to popular sovereignty, but I would also, with Lincoln, um, say some questions are not up for popular vote. It's um, an essential matter, for example, that um, uh, liberal citizens possess uh, uh, an array of rights which say, in the language of Ronald Dworkin, are trump cards that can never be taken away. Um, trump in a rather different sense. Than, uh, so. Um, I would like to come back to this main point that you made in the second part of your presentation. Uh, May Flower Pact 1620, uh, in the presence of God and of one another on the boat, and 1787, we the people. And your, your like, crucial question was how do we jump from one to the other, and was what has happened in between. And you gave many reasons, like the shared destiny and the shared interests and so on. I'm asking this question because this is also like the, the crucial background for Hannah Arendt's account of the political. I mean, for her, this is the iconic moment, the Mayflower Pact in the presence of God and of one another on this boat. This is the constitution of the political, the in-between, <laughs> literally the, the political space in between. But I was never really fully convinced in her um, how she makes this step from this iconic moment, this, this is the initial spark where it all comes from, and how to transform this into an, into an institution, in, into law and so on. Um, for how important is this initial moment for you? And what is your, like, I mean, I said you gave many motivations, but how to preserve this, this initial in the presence of one another? Every one of these questions, um, uh, truly I can't fully answer, um, but I'll try nonetheless. Um, the, um, I think the Mayflower, let's step back a little bit from the Mayflower Compact. How did these 41 men come to be there in the first place? And what shaped their sense that it was important to create a civic polity. Um, well, uh, the impossibly simple-minded answer is the Reformation and its immediate uh, aftermath. So starting 1517 and what, by the 1520s, you have um, multiple um, forms of what wasn't called Protestantism until the late 1520s, but let's call it Protestantism. Um, uh, different forms, some more radical than others. Um, uh, Luther was a moderate compared to Anabaptists, for example. Um, and the, um, what those who were excluded from um, state protection and um, physical protection by public authorities um, found they had to do was either find a public authority that would protect them um, in a period of religious warfare. Think of the peasant wars of the, of the, 18, of the 1520s. Um, or go somewhere else and found um, a, a polity which would be homogeneous. Um, and that's what the Mayflower Compact is. So for me, the Mayflower Compact is both the first moment that I know of, of, um, and Arendt thought the same, just as you say, the first moment of um, the expression of popular sovereignty in a way that, although grew out of religious commitment, was not a, simply a religious act. It was a, 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 a civic act that put legitimacy in the people. Um, uh, but at the same time, it was a deeply anti-pluralist moment. Um, the, the people, not only if you were to read or look at the history of Massachusetts in the first quarter century, say, um, uh, it banished uh, people who expressed doubts about this or that theological aspect. It punished. Um, later it had punishment, famously later, of witches and all the rest. Um, it was an oppressive um, uh, boundary uh, keeping location. To me, the wonder of the American founding and the other side of the American founding was that we had moved from this micro, small level 
boundary setting to a white polity that was incredibly heterogeneous in religious and demographic um, and cultural terms. And yet it, it, it fixed other kinds of high boundaries, um, which um, were, le were not about religion. Um, the American Constitution, the First Amendment, um, there's no establishment of religion. There are no religious tests for office in the federal Constitution. But there are racial tests. Um, uh, and the very Declaration of Independence and the Federalist Papers always puts the word savage before the word Indian. Um, which was an indication of a lack of eligibility because they weren't civilized. They were backward peoples. Um, so the two things happen together. It starts in Mayflower, and it becomes the defining issue of the American experience. But as I think each of us will know, this set of issues is not uniquely an American set of issues. The, this question of the boundaries of the civic, the nature of pluralism, the character of toleration, the institutional design is broadly shared. Um, the answers are not identical, the situations are not identical, but the questions at their fundamental level about a divided world remain with us and in a dangerous way. I, I'm going to take that as the uh, last uh, remark for the day, uh, as a concluding remark, but also the opening, in a sense, of something which we want like to do over the next years at the IWM, and that is to address the question of democracy and demography. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things you, one of the issues you open up is the whole question of who counts and how do we count? And the question is, what role does, in the US case, of course, a very particular boundary, Native Americans and um, uh, African slaves? But I think with migration, which is not an issue in the founding uh, moment of the US in the sense, as it has become in Europe, and of course, this new issue of whether only Christians count, uh, and who should count as a Christian, uh, but the whole question of whether diaspora is to be counted within uh, the political community or not, who political voice counts as being uh, part of the constituent power and who is as a migrant excluded from the political community. I think these are the questions which uh, in a sense are among the most timely and important and, ones and here. If I may, because academics love footnotes, I add a footnote to this wise <laughs> set of remarks, um, uh, namely that there's a long history in the history of liberal democracy um, for which the rule of law is a central notion that when um, those polities um, stretch beyond their borders um, into other places of the globe, often um, there were not the rule of law, but the rule of laws, plural, which had a heterogeneous quality and did not have the same um, uh, protections, eligibilities, and features of lawfulness that were enjoyed at home. So this is a multi-layered um, puzzle. It's not just a puzzle within um, our immediate worlds, but it's been a long-standing puzzle and how, broadly, and how we think about the connection between the two um, was something, interestingly, that I think Tocqueville failed at in Democracy in America, his chapter on race, the great chapter on the three races. He begins by saying, I had been talking about democracy, now I'm talking about something else. Um, but whether it's that or about the colonial experience or what have you, um, uh, uh, it's the imbrication, the interconnection, where um, these puzzles of demography and democracy have to be dealt with. That's Thank why I think Ivan's question of, you know, can one only think of this in terms of uh, the framework of a state becomes again a very important question uh, here because the borders become important. Uh, so I think, thank you very, very much for a wonderful um, a talk and I hope we can continue this conversation. And as I said, this is going to be one of the uh, things we're going to hold summer schools on uh, for the next few years on the question of the, uh, the relationship between uh, demographics, demographic imaginations, demographic anxieties, and democracy. So I hope you'll well, come back, and thank you very, very much once again. Thank you.